Welcome back to the swamp, my friends. It's good to see you all made it back for another episode. Today's episode is going to be a fun one. Today I'm going to be compiling a bunch of your favorite outdoors horror stories that I've read over the past few months. Every so often, I will compile a bunch of older stories together to make a much longer episode than usual. I do this because a lot of people like the longer videos. My average episodes are about 30 minutes to 35 minutes long, where these compilations can be anywhere between 2 and 4 hours long. I know you may have heard these stories before, and I appreciate the comments, trust me, I do know that you've heard these before, but despite what you may think, this isn't me just recycling content because I don't have any, I'm doing this because these videos do the best on the channel. If you look at the channel's best performing videos, the compilations are by far the most popular and watched videos. So, if you don't want to hear stories that you've heard before, simply click on one of the new uploads that I upload. I upload new videos almost every single day. That's well over 20 to 30 hours of content every single month. So there's never a lack of new content on the Swamp Dweller channel. I'll see you guys soon with another brand new video. I hope you enjoy this nearly two hours of scary, outdoors horror stories that you guys voted in as the scariest ones shared on the Swamp Dweller channel in the past few months. And as always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future video, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. Now, let's get into these stories that'll creep you out tonight. So the following story happened around 2014 in the Appalachian Mountains of Pennsylvania. I was somewhere around 14 or 15 years old when I had this initial experience, and it left my mind until I began researching abductions and different paranormal entities. Everyone within my rural area lives in the forest and hunts religiously, and I am no exception to that rule. It was sometime in October, archery buck season, in Bedford, Pennsylvania. It was a normal evening of hunting at the base of the mountain in the swamps that my family owned. My dad was not near me at the time as he was on the opposite end, waiting for a large buck that he had been trying to ambush. I was sitting in my climber stand in a pine tree packed area with two trails running underneath me. It was still bright outside and with just slight darkness to the area, enough that you could see a haze of flashlight yet still see clearly ahead without it. I was facing the mountainside so thick that pine trees mostly covered the sky from my view. I heard leaves begin to crackle, and suddenly roughly five or six deer ran full speed past my stand and back up the mountain. They came out of the pine saplings that lay in front of me, as if they came out of nowhere. It was at that moment a massive LED-looking light flashed and seemed to fill the sky above me. It was a bluish light and covered three to four treetops. As quickly as it flashed, it left, however, and when it left, everything turned dark. It was ridiculous to think that it turned dark that quickly, as I could not see the reflective side of my bow at that point. It was as if the sun just went out as soon as it went over the distant mountains on my back. I sat there dumbfounded pondering what had happened for about 10 minutes before my dad came by on his side-by-side -side on the road. I left the stand that night weirded out by it, but I tried not to think much of it until the next day. I woke up with a cold sore in my left eye, which is not unusual for me, as it happened all the time due to sunlight or stress. I got dressed and went to school, but as the day went on, I began to get a bad headache. I made it to lunch when a lunch lady, who was a friend, looked at me bewildered. I had not noticed, but on the right side of my head, it was swollen severely. It was sticking out a good half inch. Almost, it seemed to be giving me a lopsided appearance. She told me to go to the nurse's office quickly. I went to the nurse's suite, and she promptly called my mom to take me to the doctor she thought I may have contracted shingles from a teacher who had an outbreak that month. We went to the doctor, and he looked at me and sent me home after explaining it was probably a poison of some kind while I was up in that tree that got on me. I know my area, and there is not poison oak locally, 
and I do not get affected by poison ivy all that much. After I got home, I forgot about the situation and moved on. My head got better, and I did not give it much thought until this summer when I had my first sleep paralysis situation. After I had it, I began to investigate different paranormal things, and for the first time, I looked into abduction stories and Mothman sightings. Conjunctivitis and different after effects made me think back to my experience with the tree stand. The reasons I'm bringing this story up is because of the lost time that went by, the sudden flash, the deer appearing from nowhere without any prior sound, and the after effects of the experience which happened the day after. I do not remember seeing anything or having nightmares directly after the incident, but it makes me wonder what I saw that night. If anybody listening to the show has any idea what this could have been, please let me know down in the comments. It'd be greatly appreciated. To preface this story, I am a bit of a skeptic when it comes to the paranormal. I am open-minded, but I always look for a rational explanation for odd things. My husband and I live on a farm of about 100 acres and raise cattle. It is a family farm. My dad grew up here and my grandpa lived and worked this land until the day he died. I am familiar with every inch and have never felt scared walking the farm or the surrounding land. A few months ago, one of our cattle disappeared. She had a calf, and if you are unfamiliar with cattle, it is strange for a cow to leave her calf, depending on the cow, of course. Our farm is in the Appalachian foothills in Kentucky, so there are quite a few haulers around. We figured that the cow probably wandered down into the hauler and died in the brush somewhere, or got into a neighbor's field. My husband looked and looked, but never found her. Never found a body, never found any evidence of that cow. The day she went missing, there were some strange spots in the grass of the field where it was all laid down as if something had smashed it, and oddly enough, two vehicles ran out of gas right near those weird spots. I thought it was just a weird spooky coincidence. Today, my favorite cow went missing. My husband, sister, and I spent approximately five hours searching for this cow. We combed every inch of fields, we searched the haulers, we checked the neighbor's fields, no sign of her. She also had a calf, and was notoriously known to be a good mama, and the calf is still here. I figured she got out into a neighboring cornfield, or perhaps someone stole her, which would have been weird because she was an older cow and was the only one missing. Until I experienced the strangest thing that makes me think that maybe it is supernatural. My sister and I were out hunting. We were looking for the missing cows and we were also looking for dinner. It was around 6.30 to 7 p.m. In between two of our fields, there is a piece of land that we do not own that juts in between two of the fields we do own. It is mostly a wooded area and is bordered with a barbed wire fence. I knew our cows sometimes crossed over, so I wanted to search in there. I've also seen some pretty big bucks in there before so maybe we'd be getting ourselves some good deer meat. My sister and I, both in our late 20s and growing up in woods all around, we always hunted, climbed waterfalls, dodged snakes, pulled ticks off ourselves. Nothing really scared us, and nothing really scares us now. I crossed over the barbed wire to go look for the cow, and my sister stopped, which is weird. She is my younger sister and always follows me no matter where we go. I was teasing her, calling her a chicken, and telling her I had been there before and that I would not take her anywhere dangerous, and she knows that. She kept stalling, and I finally got short with her and yelled at her to come on. She crossed the barbed wire, but kept stopping. Finally, she caught up to me, but as I walked further into the woods, I just got a bad feeling. The only way I can describe it is, it's just ominous and dark. My sister also kept saying that she could not hear me even though I was talking loudly and was only like two feet away from her. I couldn't have been any further than that. I finally stopped, turned around, and we booked it out of there. Once we crossed back over the barbed wire, that feeling went away. 
My sister went home for a couple of hours because she was so unusually tired. I texted her and asked her if she thought the woods felt off. She says that she was terrified the entire time. I will quote what she said below. It was like we were going down a path, a dark path to nowhere. I like to explore, but it did not feel right. It gives me chills and almost makes me want to cry just thinking about it. So I just told myself I was psyching myself out. It was right when we passed the fence, like we were somewhere we should not have been. I was scared. I trust you and everything, of course, but the feeling I got standing and looking into the woods was just telling me not to go, not to cross the fence. The farther we went, the worse it got, like a shadow or something screaming at me, telling me to go back. Afterward, I got a heavy feeling making me so tired and sad. This all happened in one evening. We never found the cow or any sign of her, and we never found any good deer to bag. I also have this horrible lingering feeling from being in those woods. I feel dread when I think about it. I'm exhausted and I'm jumpy. I wanted to recount this story somewhere so I would not forget the details and see if anyone has had any similar experiences or thoughts on what might be happening supernatural or otherwise. I can tell you, I have never felt anything like that in my entire life, and my sister is never scared, which scared me even more. So, I'm not sure how creepy this is, but it was creepy for a Halloween day at sunset for me. I was walking my dog in Vermont on a class 4 road. For those who don't know what that is, that is a road that a town does not maintain well. About a quarter of a mile from my house, as I do almost every day for the past 3 years, I walk this path. There is a noticeably short road that leads to the river and right behind my neighbor's house who also has a dog. Walking up the road, my dog pulled me into the woods about 5 steps. She was adamant about smelling whatever was over there. When I looked up, I saw the vilest thing I've ever seen aside from a horror movie. It was the warm, steaming entrails of what looked like was a large animal. We were still about 10 feet away, so I paused for a moment, honestly thinking it was a Halloween prank, but what I believed happened was that a hunter, or something, had gutted an animal and left the guts in the woods. I was shaken at the sight, as I am no hunter, and it was creepy and horrifying. We turned around, and I had to pick up my small dog because she was interested in the smell. Although this is not a well-maintained road, local people and tourists still use it. Three or four cars drove past me on our way down. I felt bad that my dog was not really getting her normal walk, so we went down this offshoot road down to the river, as we had done many times before. It was not even a three minute walk, and I want to stress this is a road that people use even though it leads to the river. As we approached the water, I can see the back of my neighbor's house at this point. I noticed that there was a gray jeep parked across the river. I pulled my dog back towards the main road, but she was in attack mode because we never see people across the river. She did not want to come, so I coaxed her with some treats. Then the jeep engine started. I started walking faster and picked up my dog. The jeep began inching towards the river and eventually across it. I am running at this point up the hill. I was trying to call my sister using Siri on my phone because I was so scared. And I wanted someone to know what was happening. I got back up to the other road and started bolting towards the gated area because I did not think the jeep would be able to follow me there. Before I could squeeze through the gate, the man yelled, Hey you, I need to talk to you. I was really scared, but I thought maybe if I was nice, he wouldn't kill me. He said, Hey, just to let you know, it's hunting season and I almost shot you. I do know it's hunting season, which is why both me and my dog have bright reflective pink vest on. I have never seen a hunter there in the six years I have lived on this road. You can't be walking there during hunting season. We all need to do our part, he said shortly. I abandoned my instinct to be kind at this point. I'll do my part by wearing a vest if you do yours by not shooting at me. He did not like that. He shook his head in anger 
and stepped on the gas peeling away. I am so sorry for all the detail, but I want to emphasize that hunters have never been allowed to hunt in these areas, especially so close to home. I have no idea what this guy was trying to do, but I do intend to contact our local game wardens and town clerk to confirm, but I'm pretty sure this guy was off his rocker and was looking for an excuse to cause a confrontation. Thanks for reading my somewhat creepy encounter. I'm sorry if it wasn't that creepy, but I know it might be a nice break from some of the more intense stories you share on the channel. My name is Lamar. I am currently 15 and live in the state of Oregon, and what I'm about to share with you is 100% real. You have the choice of not of believing me, I guess, but I could add you to the list. I'm sorry I'm getting off topic. My first encounter with what I believe to be the Wendigo happened when I was 13 years old. I was on a hunting trip with my grandfather, Wayne. He is a retired army vet. The reason I'm telling you this will come into play later. We were out hunting rabbits and hares because I thought the only way to become a man was to go out hunting. My mom forced me to do it anyway. She said I was too much of a shut-in sitting on my Xbox too much and I ended up getting a lecture about how when she was my age, she would be outside, yada, yada, yada. So as soon as my grandfather had brought it up, she jumped at the opportunity to get me out of the house. To be honest, it was quite fun except for the not showering for a week. We were winding down for our last night there, only being able to snag three rabbits, mainly because I'm such a bad shot. The sun was setting, so... We decided to hit the hay in our all too big and expensive tent made for six, even though I was only 5'10 at the time and he's probably 5'11, but I guess he needed his space. It was around 2 a.m. I only remember this because I had snuck my phone out when my mom wasn't looking. When we started noticing strange noises, like something heavy stomping around our camp, we noticed a horrid smell, like rotted meat and dead skunk. We thought maybe it was the rabbit, but my grandfather told me there is no way that the rabbits would smell that bad. It took everything in our power not to start gagging, and for me, it takes a lot to make me gag. I am a teenage boy with two dogs, but the smell even made my eyes start to water. My grandfather also reminded me the rabbits were outside, so the thought had popped into my head that the noises could be a bear perhaps, but my grandfather shut that down. He said, there is no way that is a bear. I almost soiled myself. What could be that big? I am no hunting expert, but I am pretty sure no other animal could be that big. My grandpa told me to stay while he checked it out. He looked outside of our tent's window, and then I saw his eyes bulge with what looked like fear. As if he could read my mind, he put his hand over my mouth to shush me. I had then gotten frustrated with him and moved his hand off my face and asked him what was going on. He then looked at me with fake calmness and said, Grandson, that is no bear. I got tired of hearing that and went to go see what he had seen. I lifted the flap of the tent window and I began to look out. I even laughed a bit as when I looked in the direction of where he was looking at, all I saw was a pair of antlers sticking out of the bushes. I even attempted to put it on Snapchat to show everyone how my grandpa is with jokes, but my phone dies, which makes me angry because I have nothing to keep me entertained for the car ride back to Portland, all the way from Eastern Oregon. I was cursing myself for not turning it off during the trip to conserve power, but while I'm doing that, the thing that I thought was some sort of buck or elk started to rise. Then, I got a good look at the face that was carrying those antlers. The first thing I saw was those cold, dead, hungry red eyes. Then, the whole face. Dear God, I wish I had not seen that thing. It had like a skull face, but it was like, sort of like a canine. It had black matted fur that threatened to fall off with the slightest touch. 
this thing suddenly stood higher. Then I saw the rest of it. Long, slender arms with claws on each of its hands. Bones that threatened to tear its skin with the slightest wrong movement. Then I noticed that the teeth, those teeth, could tear flesh from anything if it wanted to. I was so scared, I even started crying. My grandfather pulled me down and kept asking me over and over if it saw me. My grandfather told me the only thing I could say was when to go. He said I was in a trance, like, like he'd just never seen before. He tried to get me to snap out of it, and he just could not. I kept repeating the same term over and over. One thing that got me to snap out of it, though, was the inhuman screech. And what I heard is nothing like I hear people say. It's hard to even imagine. It's like an eagle screech, but its screech would make its throat start to rip and tear and then mix it with a man screaming in agony. It's a sound that is so inhuman that I don't know how to explain it. Then we heard it leave the bush and enter our camp. It then let out another screech which made me cover my head and fall to the ground crying. My grandfather was not able to get as good of a view as I had, so he silently zipped down the tent and peeked outside. When he did, he immediately zipped it back up. My grandfather came back with the most terrified look on his face. This freaked me out even more because my grandfather had watched his best friend get murdered, had seen people burned alive after they were hit with napalm. He is a 200 pound man of nothing but muscle and I've never seen fear in his face. We then remembered we had left our rabbits right by our tent. Then we heard it coming on away and I could see the shape of it. This thing was most likely three feet taller than us at the very least. I then heard it start to crunch and tear the rabbits apart outside, which makes me think that maybe that's all at once. It then crunched loudly and it made me whimper, which caused the creature to raise its head and let out a deafening screech. At that point, I could not take it anymore and broke down crying for my mother. The creature then started circling the tent it would sometimes flinch at us, like it was playing with us. Which made me angry. This thing was trying to play with its food before eating it. It's like we were toys and enjoyed our suffering. It could easily cut through our tent to get us. But what were we going to do with our metal BBs and measly hunting knife? We went hunting, and now we have become the hunted. What comes next will stay with my mind forever and the remainder of my life. This thing cut through our tent and put its head inside. My grandfather immediately went into protective mode and put me behind him. I was too much of a coward to investigate the face of death, but my grandfather had the heart of a lion in that moment. He took a knife and put it in his hand and he was ready to fight. All I could do is cry into his back. He then made a ballsy move and took his eye off the monster in front of us to tell me he is sorry and that he loves me. I looked at him and then went back to crying and told him in between breaths that I loved him too. The creature seemed to be annoyed at this point and attempted to get its hands through. And when it did, my grandfather let out a yell and stabbed its hand which made the creature rear back in pain and let out yet another screech. The creature was beyond angry and was about to go in for another round. But the sun had started to rise and the creature had slowly backed away and headed back into the brush, but then turned around and looked through the hole it had created. I swear it smiled at us, as if to say this was not over. It then retreated into the forest, and I have never seen it since. My grandfather had sprung into action leaving over $1,000 of gear behind and pulled me all the way to our car. He did not even put on his seatbelt as he floored it out of there. We did not start talking until we were on the freeway back home, and he asked in a calm voice, did I know what that thing was? To which I said no, and he explained all about the Wendigo. Honestly, like I said in the beginning, I don't care if people believe this encounter, because I know it's true. I will be submitting another story on another day, and I hope you guys enjoy this.
It was 2019, sometime in November if I remember correctly. I went hunting with my family on our massive farm that we own. I would love to share the location, but I have been stalked a few times, and that is still a fear of mine right now. Anyway, we set out around 5 in the morning, but that is not too important. Later that day, my cousin finally got one, a medium-sized buck, a four-pointer. It was growing dark as we got the buck into the garage to prepare. Anyway, as we were skinning the deer, the forest grew eerily silent. The only sound was the light footsteps in the forest and a coyote howling in the distance. By the time we finished skinning the deer, it was pitch black. Just as we were about to leave the garage and go eat dinner, the door got stuck. My uncle was relatively mad and fought with it and could not get the garage door all the way closed. But eventually, he gave up. So we go eat and then off to bed. I could not sleep. Something just kept me up that night. I had the best bed, warm temperatures, everything was perfect, but I could not sleep. My window was opened and I was hearing crunches outside. Now keep in mind this is about one in the morning. I tossed and turned, but nothing, nothing could help me fall asleep. Then, out of nowhere, the tapping and scratching started on my window screen. I was horrified. I grabbed my phone, shined the light over the screen, and what I saw will never leave my mind. It was the deer. The deer we had just skinned earlier. But I forgot to mention, this deer had a huge dent in its skull. We had no idea why, but, but on this imposter, the same dent was in the same place. I was slightly alarmed at the sight, and then I remembered the window was six feet off the ground. I froze in fear, and this thing let out a growl and stared at me. I tried to ignore it, but fear overwhelmed me, and I fainted. I woke up the next morning and ran to the garage. The skin was gone, and... All that was left was a pool of blood. The deer was still hanging up fine, though. I ran over to my window. There were prints. But these prints were not deer prints. They looked like footprints mixed with a deer hoof and some kind of deep indentation that could have been a claw mark. My brother-in-law just heard this story this past Christmas and he has been telling my sister and I that we should share it somewhere. And what better place than the swamp? My family has some property that backs up to the Carson National Forest in New Mexico. It has been in the family for years and my sister and I both spent our summers up there. It is gorgeous. Well, it is for people who lived out in far west Texas. It was nice and green, cool mountain air in the summer. It was always a relief to get up there and get away from a dusty ranch. My dad was ex-military and having two daughters, let us just say we did lots of outdoor stuff. He taught us survival skills and how to defend ourselves. We hunted and fished and did lots of camping and hiking. To us, it was always a fun time, but I guess he felt the need to pass skills to us. We spent several weeks in the summer up there hiking with him and exploring the old cabins mining communities, and checking out the big ditch project that was built for the Red River back in the late 1800s. I think that's the right date or something, but I am unsure. Anyways, it is a great place to hike with some beautiful high mountain lakes, streams, lots of wildlife, etc. This happened when I was in college, and my younger sister was still in high school. My dad was still at home, having to work, 
and would come up every few weeks to spend time with us. We were up there with our mom, and she mainly spent time in town or around the property painting. We spent our time on the jeep trails, or hiking, or sleeping. It was late June, maybe early July, and we had decided that we were going to hike up to the Lost Lake. It is one of my favorite lakes up there, because if you look at it from a certain angle, it looks like a heart. We set off in the morning, and we were prepared. We both had a small pack, our water, some snacks, and we both had a small hammock we planned to set up once we got to the lake so we can enjoy the area for a while. I will admit to being an outdoor type, and I swear, when it's quiet enough, you can even hear the trees talking. We also always carry a knife when we hiked. My dad always insisted we have something, just in case an accident happened, or we just needed it. The hike was going well. Since the summer cabin is far up the valley, we just set out on a foot to the trailhead. To get to Lost Lake, you take another trail that goes up to Middle Fork Lake. Then you break off that trail for Lost Lake. We run into a few other hikers, but they are going to Middle Fork Lake, and we were pleased because it would look like we would have the lake to ourselves. It is a good hike with some long switchbacks at the end, but totally worth it because the lake is just beautiful and an emerald green color. We finally arrived and saw that we did have the lake to ourselves. We hiked around the lake and decided to hike back a bit to find a good spot to set up our hammocks. We walked into the tree line and the first thing my sister did was say, Do you smell that? And indeed I did. It was a dead animal for sure, with the strong scent of blood. We had both done lots of hunting and we knew the smell pretty well. And that is when I saw it. It was a deer carcass. But what was around it is what disgusted me. Placed around the deer carcass in a circle were its organs, entrails, etc. But it was not like it was being cleaned. It was like they were placed there in certain arrangements. With just piles of rocks in between everything. Like small little statues almost. Now I know how some people get disgusting with their kills. And I have had some guys try to gross me out. But I do not fall for crap like that. But this made me uneasy. It was just not being cleaned. It was like it was set up in a certain meaning. Or maybe it had a meaning all its own. I stepped back from this weird circle, and when my sister starts to say my name, but stops. Because then, we see the guy who had done this. And he looks like he climbed out from inside the deer. Because he is covered in blood, and does not have much clothing on. At first, I thought he did not have anything on, but... Honestly, I did not try to check him out much. He was standing back away from his gruesome little circle, just standing close to a group of trees that were close together. He was maybe 20 feet or so from us. I think he was maybe trying to hide? Not for sure, but my dad had always taught us that if we ever found ourselves in a situation where we did not feel we were in control, to do everything in our power to take control of the situation. Do something that is going to take the other person by surprise. Do not do something they would expect you to do. So, this was raging through my brain, and I could also tell my sister was about to freak the heck out. So I stepped up and yelled, Hey, fairly good kill you got there. Did you use a bow? The guy just stood there, his eyes all crazy wide like he was stoked out of his brain on planet Pluto or something. So, I'm thinking, great. We ran into a guy getting his hunt on, and he had lost it, and now he's getting blood crazy with his deer. He was staring me down, and I was staring right back, and my sister was getting ready to run. I still don't know what came over me, but I then put my hand on my knife that I kept on my waist just to show him that I was not completely helpless. I do not know why I did it, but something told me to let him know I was not going to back down or be afraid. I kept eye contact with him, and I would guess he was maybe in his early 30s, but I am bad at guessing people's ages. He was pretty dirty though. You could tell that even with all the blood he had everywhere, he had not showered in quite some time. I start to back off and my sister had moved behind me, so I spoke again and said, So, I hope you have a great hunting day. Again, the crazy guy didn't say a thing, just stood there like a statue or something, or like he thought I couldn't see him if he didn't move or make any sound. 
we moved back to the lakeside again and booked it around the lake. My sister stayed up front, and she was shaking bad. I was mainly angry at first because if he wanted to get all crazy in the woods with this deer, then he should have gone further back up into the forest. We get back to the trailhead and stop to get our bearing and looked at each other. I was scanning the forest line to make sure we were not being followed, and my sister was just in shock. We started down the trail pretty fast, and I was hoping I could keep my sister together until we could at least reach the Middle Fork Lake Trail, or that we would even run into some more hikers. But the odds were not good on this trail because you must get an early start on Lost Lake Trail, and by now it was late morning and early afternoon. We were making good time and had not discussed what we saw, just started hiking back down. I started to get that feeling when you just know you're not alone. I kept checking, but I did not see a single thing or even hear anything at first. My sister refused to look back and just kept going, but I felt like I had to keep checking to make sure that idiot was not following us. That is when the first stuff came flying at us. It was like small pebbles, but it really made me angry because it was obvious somebody was throwing them at us, and it could have only been him. My sister was almost running at this point, but I am a mouthy smart aleck. I blame the Texas upbringing, and darn it, this was my forest. I had grown up here, and these were my lakes, my trails, and I was not about to let some crazy dude ruin it for me. And I started yelling back that he needed to go back to his deer and leave us alone. At this point, my sister is telling me to shut up and just come on, and I am thinking, no way, this guy is just trying to scare us. The pebble stopped, and then we started hearing barking and growling noises. My sister said, now he's growling at us? And I just told her to get on down the trail and ignore it. He was behind us pretty much the whole way, growling and making these barking noises occasionally, but I never caught a glimpse of him. Once we got close enough to where the trail joined with the Middle Fork Trail, he seemed to back off. I never caught sight of him from behind us, but I could hear him, and I just knew he was there. We started down the rest of the trail. My sister refused to stop or look behind her, so I kept checking every so often. I did not see anything or hear anything. We started to discuss what had happened, and she felt like he was a very sinister and not good guy. She had felt like we had been in a very dangerous situation, and I felt like he was just getting kicks out of scaring two girls. I mean, he had to have heard us coming around the lake. We weren't being quiet. It was the opposite because there are black bears up there and we would always be pretty loud while hiking. Hoping to scare off any bear in the area, really, so we wouldn't come up on one. To this day, she still thinks he was sinister, and I still think he was just trying to scare two girls and was getting his kicks out of it. We told our parents, and my dad did not like what he heard at all. He did teach us some more up-close defense skills after that day, and forbid us from ever hiking alone or just the two of us again. We did not hike up that trail for several years. Honestly, it freaked my sister out, and I just did not like remembering a time that I was scared in the forest. I didn't know it at the time, but after we had gotten back to the house and told my mom, she had called some neighbors and a few of the men hiked up there the next day to check things out. They did find the deer carcass and some empty hiking packs. They also found a rustic campsite further back in the woods that had been cleared out as well. They found some empty hiking packs as well that day hikers use. It's not that creepy, I guess, but pretty strange nonetheless. I am now a 72-year-old man. This happened long ago, but I remember it so well. The background was a series of events that placed me in a mountain cabin outside of Frederick, Maryland, circa 1969 or 1970. Just say my life at the time was in disarray. I had dropped out of college, my father had died, and I was alienated. I needed to get my mind right. The opportunity to move to an isolated cabin to live in contemplation and solitude was a welcomed idea. I had some inheritance money to pay for it. To the best of my memory, I was there eight to nine months. No TV, nothing but books and radio. I had a library card, 
and I cannot remember if I had a phone. The story begins when a month into my stay, a female beagle showed up to my door. She was a lost dog, and I took her in. I could never train her to do anything, but I fed her, and she was a sweet, if not the brightest dog. A few months in, I began to feel a presence around the isolated cabin. It was hard to describe, but I felt like someone was watching. On many occasions, I thought someone might even be looking into my cabin window, watching us. The next phase was the shadow or the sense of following. I knew the folks a half mile down the lane, woods all around, and would sometimes visit them at night. Someone, something, was waiting for me and followed closely in the woods beside me in the darkness. Anytime I would hike, you could hear it, easily, footsteps in the woods, and it picked up its pace as I did. This not only happened to me, but my younger brother who visited, and to friends. It spooked them, big time. At night it was out there, around the cabin. Here's the funny thing. I was never afraid. I never felt threatened, if you will. Not at all, well, at least early on anyway. There was no feeling of malevolence. I spent a good bit of time wandering the vast areas of woodlands around me. There was a state park just up the hill, and the Frederick Municipal Forest went on for mile after mile. The whole of Western Maryland was much more country than it is now. None of the development had set in yet, so hiking was endless. In our hikes, the dog and I, we came across evidence of campsites, recent ones in the woods, traces of fires, old, abandoned buildings that had corners that gave shelter and looked like something was sleeping in it. Garbage, food, drinks, paper, what have you, we found it. Perhaps hunters, but much of it did not have the organized feeling you would get from experienced hunters. The last month of my stay there was when things intensified. Maybe he sensed I was preparing to leave. In the mornings, I would find small dead animals at the bottom of the front steps. The cabin had a small front porch, screened with a light door, and four wooden steps to the ground. A spotlight would illuminate the long front yard, with woods close by either side. Dead animals began to appear at the bottom of the steps many mornings. I remember small birds, then a squirrel, a rabbit, even a weasel one day. Like they were offerings in a sense. I had to grab them up before the dog ate them. This went on almost daily for several weeks. One night, extremely late, I was awoken by a strange sound. I lay in bed and heard something from the porch. I hopped up and hit the lights and I saw that hound dog, who never learned to sit or stay, standing at the front door, in a perfect point position. She was shaking in fear. She never barked. I heard the door slam and footsteps down the steps. I hit the spotlight but saw nothing. I went out. He had been on the porch, my front door, maybe trying to enter. After that, I stayed in at night more and more. The animal offerings got bigger and bigger, Larger birds, a possum, a woodchuck. It was not funny. The two final quote-unquote gifts were legs from either horses or cows. Big and bloody. One was skinned. Holy crap. The second to last day, the dog left me. I could hear her in the woods howling on a trail following a scent. I looked for her everywhere I could, but I couldn't find her. In the following weeks, I came and searched, but to no avail. She left as she came. I moved back to the Maryland suburbs of DC. I got an apartment with a friend, I got a job, and moved on with my life. One day, not long after I picked up the Washington Post, there was an article about recent encounters with the Sykesville monster. It described a tall, yeti-like creature, fur covered on two legs that would pick out a family or a person and give them quote-unquote attention. I was not the only one. The attention described in the article was exactly what happened to me. It was following you at night, looking inside the house, giving you gifts, so to speak, and so on. I was shocked. If I had turned on the spotlight and seen a Bigfoot or a Yeti, I might still be running to this day. But I think I know who it was. Sykesville, Maryland was the location of the Springfield Hospital Center, a large state psychiatric hospital. 
It was 20 miles or so east of Frederick. Back then, many folks knew how to live in the woods. They grew up that way, country folks. I think the monster was an escaped patient, or just a free schizophrenic who lived outside. This is like all the homeless you see in cities now, probably off his meds, but somehow functional and lonely. He would pick people or families to, a quote unquote, adopt. The camps in the woods would have been him. Nothing to do, he would make mischief. I think he liked me, but sensed I was leaving. This happened back in 2009 or 2010. I was visiting Hawaii at the age of 14 with my family. My father, cousin, and I went hiking for the day. I believe we drove up to the top of Moana Key State Park. We then took a hike down to an old inactive volcano face and walked on it for two hours. The hike back up to the forested mountain was about an hour long. My father, cousin, and I were about halfway back to our car, and being the young teenager I was, I decided to race them back. I ran ahead going off trail a bit climbing back up. Then, suddenly, I was in a 20 by 20 fenced in area on the top of the mountain. I was extremely confused because I had never climbed a fence. I stood in this fenced in area trying to determine how it had gotten there, then realized something felt completely off. I then climbed back down the mountain, eventually found the trail, and went back to my car. My father and cousin were worried and said I was gone for around three hours and they were searching the whole time. However, to me, it felt like I was only gone for about 30 to 40 minutes at max. A few years passed and I forgot about the situation. However, after listening to a recent podcast from the swamp, somebody mentioned missing 411 in one of their stories and I recalled my experience. I recently spoke to my cousin and father and they both recall the event the exact same as I do and remember how scared I was and how I kept mentioning how I ended up in a fenced in area without climbing a fence. Does anyone have any similar experiences, particularly within Hawaii? Before I tell my story, some of you might not find it scary or funny as people I have told laughed. I do not care if you believe it, because this definitely happened. I feel as I could have lost my life. I live in the San Gabriel Valley, which is east of Los Angeles just outside the city. I asked my friend, A, to go hiking with me. We planned to go hiking to South Mount Hawkins. The hike was a little long, maybe around 12 miles. I was up to the challenge and picked up an early start to get an early start. However, we got lost and ended up in the parking lot of what I believe was the Azusa River Wilderness. I parked and said, F it, we're lost. I was a little upset and my friend and I began to look over the trail map that they have on display to see if we could find the correct trail. It was about 7am and it was already very foggy. The parking lot was empty except for the cars of the nearby homes and a random van on the other side of the parking lot. I did not really focus on the van too much, I just wanted to get this hike started. Then I heard the van door open and my friend and I looked. A man stepped out and began jogging over to us. I thought nothing of it, he was probably lost like we were, but the weird thing is that he was not dressed for hiking. He had jeans and flannel on like he was going to a bar. As he got closer, I realized he was barefoot and was looking directly at me. I still tried to find some excuse that maybe he did not have time to put on his shoes or boots and just wanted to ask a quick question. How naive I was. When he approached me, he asked me a question that completely threw me off guard. Why are you saying evil things about me? I was beyond confused. I honestly did not know what to say and looked over at my friend who was just as confused. Um, I didn't say any evil things about you, I said. Yes, you did. I heard every evil word you said about me. His tone was becoming more threatening. Again, I defended myself and said something like, I didn't say anything evil. I don't even know who you are. Then things got tense. He got extremely close 
and I mean so close where I could smell his breath. He then said, Why would you say those evil things about me? Don't you know it's wrong to say evil things about people? You should be ashamed of yourself for that. Now, I am 5'7 and 175 pounds. I'm a pretty solid dude, but this guy was at least 6'2", so he towered over me. I also had no weapons whatsoever and did not even know what he had, so any attack would have happened quick. My eyes did not leave his, and as if they were deadlocked. So many thoughts and fears raced through my mind. I thought about my parents, my brother, my friends. Is this how I end? Then, I do not know what made me say it, but I told him that I was sorry for saying those evil things. What happened next was weird. He looked at me, confused about what I had said, looked around and then ran back into his van. I stood there frozen, but I was finally able to breathe. A and I decided just to hike to the nearby trail to blow off steam. I had a mix of fear, anger, anxiety, and confusion as to what had just happened. I figured he was either on drugs or was probably a schizophrenic. When we got back, his van was still there, but the parking lot was filled with families. I did not say anything to them, even if I should have warned them. I asked my friend A, you're a marine, if he had done something, you would have jumped in, right? He shook his head. Dude, he was legit inches from you. Even if he pulled out a knife, you would have been stabbed and probably would have died. I'm grateful I found a way to de-escalate the situation. This serves as a reminder that you should always trust your red flag instincts when encountering strangers. Before we jump into today's video, I just wanted to welcome a new sponsor to the show. Welcome, IP Vanish. So, what is IP Vanish, you ask? IP Vanish is a virtual private network, a VPN for short. A VPN is a super important tool that helps you safely browse the internet. You can use a VPN on your computers, tablets, phones, and even things like your Fire Stick when you're streaming media. When you use a VPN, all your data is encrypted. What you're reading, what you're searching, what you're watching, whatever it is you're doing. IP Vanish is just $3.49 a month. For just $3.49 a month or $27.99 a year, you can help protect your online privacy and security. You get an anonymous IP address. This means your IP address can't be tracked by anyone on the web. You can circumvent any online censorship. IP Vanish has more than 1,500 servers in 70 plus locations. You can get protection when using public Wi-Fi. Remember, with IP Vanish, all your data is encrypted, so no one can snoop on what you're doing no matter where you're at. Go to ipvanish.com slash swamped and claim your 65% savings. They have plans starting at just $3.49 a month and $27.99 a year. This is the time to sign up. With our discount and their current promotional offerings, you can get a VPN for 65% off their usual offering. IP Vanish is the best of the best, even rated 4.7 out of 5 stars on Trustpilot, and that's with more than 6,000 reviews. Show these guys some love. Remember, it's ipvanish.com slash swamped to get the deal and to start protecting yourself online. Now, this is not my experience, but my friend's father. He told us around this camp trip his son invited us on. He told us the story of him and his siblings living in the rural forest area of an undeveloped New York state. He told us around where he lived there was a dark forest grown of pine needles. Forest for miles undiscovered, planted by millions of Americans who lost their jobs during the Great Depression. He and his siblings lived in surrounding areas, and every evening, after his mother had left for work, they ventured into the surrounding peaceful areas of the woods, and they would often venture around the open woods that allowed more natural sunlight to shine in. However, during these expeditions around a specific pine tree within the woods, the children would often get very sleepy, almost like a sound of a natural lullaby that would put them to sleep for who knows how long within the woods. He told us that he and his siblings would go out there and explore. His older sibling would watch them during their expeditions. They would also fall asleep with them every single time. But here's where the story gets weird. 
This was like a nest of some sort, made of pine needles and other soft materials from the forest. He told us that they would not go any further than those pine trees, because every time, they would fall asleep. He said something felt like it did not enjoy intruders coming into its territory, and so they stayed along the wooden tree land, but explored every acre they had except for that area. He informed us how these lullaby instances would feel as if they were floating in a boat being jostled around and being carried in someone or something's arms. Remember, he is one of four siblings. The oldest was 16 at the time. It would not be able to carry all of them. It would be insane. He recalled that one morning had come. They were in their clothing sleeping against a huge tree on their property and saw their mom pulling up in the morning. She was coming home from work. He and his siblings awoke to see that they were very confused and had no idea how they got out there. When they were often deep in the woods, miles from home, they would recall being awoken randomly and never knowing that they fell asleep. He recalled once being awoken by himself, feeling a presence that there was some sort of monster that was six to nine feet tall with womanly proportions of the chest. He said it felt like this thing had a nurturing presence. It was able to carry them all by itself, often bringing them back to their house, gently putting them down and letting them sleep before wandering back into the woods. He believes that this was a mother Sasquatch that lived in the nearby forest of New York. There are many mountainous and forest regions in that area. He thinks maybe she could have lost her young and saw them in the forest and decided to care for them and keep them safe from harm. I know this story was a bit confusing, but thank you for sharing it. The argument started the same way every time. You'll never catch me dead in a national park. They're full of nothing but fat tourists and RV. I'm from the old school, and I like it that way. The old school was a kind description of how he camped. If it was made up from anything other than canvas or leather, he considered it newfangled junk. My mother tried on multiple occasions to introduce new things, such as a nylon tent, but he was just not having it. He would rather carry that big, musty wall tent everywhere he camped, and do not get me started about the stinking cans of kerosene that always leaked all over everything. He was certainly a man born too late. The term roughing it had been coined with him in mind. He would continue to suffer through his archaic ways of experiencing the outdoors until the near death of my younger brother showed him the error of his ways. Throughout the early 80s, my dad would drag us out into the National Forest during Thanksgiving. The weather was relatively mild for the time of year, and the forest was absolutely beautiful. I could still smell the pine trees. These retreats always seemed to coincide with the hunting season for some reason. I remember hearing dad used to hunt before meeting our mom. I think she forbade him from doing it anymore, so this was his way of sticking it to her. Either way, gunshots near the camp were a common sound. I guess because our parents grew up with extraordinarily little oversight, me and my brother Mike had the same childhood. No one considered that it may be dangerous with a bunch of trigger-happy guys around to let two young boys play in the woods alone. It was normal for the two of us to leave camp at dawn, play all morning until lunchtime, and then go back out until supper. We had been doing this for as long as I can remember, and no one ever batted an eye. On one specific Thanksgiving, we had been running and crawling through the underbrush all day. This was during the time G.I. Joe and Rambo were at the height of their popularity. Mike and I loved dressing up in our camouflage clothes and playing war. Mike's birthday had been just a few days before, and he got a pair of G.I. Joe walkie-talkies. Looking back, they were absolute junk, but we loved them for what they were. After lunch, we returned to the woods. I cannot remember exactly what I was doing at that moment, but I know Mike was trying to sneak up on me. I was sitting on a fallen tree and suddenly heard a loud bang, quickly followed by a whistling going by my head. I dropped flat on my stomach and waited for another shot. I was not sure what was happening, but something told me to stay where I was. 
No more than 30 seconds had passed when I heard a faint moaning in the distance. Since Mike was missing at that second, I called him on the walkie-talkie. No answer came, but I heard a new noise. This sounded like my name, so I called Mike again. No answer. Now, honestly, I was getting scared. Without any other ideas, I yelled out his name. I told him the game was over and he needed to answer me. I was not sure if he was trying to trick me or was in real trouble. I listened very intently, but nothing but the faint rustle of leaves could be heard. I walked in the direction of the rustle and listened again. Nothing. So I called out again, and the rustling repeated, followed by another moan. I ran in that direction about 20 yards and stopped. The rustling came again, just to my right and awfully close. I could not see anything at first, so I dropped to my stomach and scanned the ground. About three feet away, I see the bottom of a Nike shoe. I knew it had to be Mike. I ran to the bush and he was laying under. The sight I came upon still breaks my heart to this day. There was Mike, staring at me with a terrified look on his face. Just under his arm was a hole with blood pouring out of it. It, it shocked me, but I did the best I could to play it cool. I did not want to make him any more scared than he already was. Had I been older, I may have known how not to move him or move him better or what, but I just reached down and scooped him up in my arms. He was too heavy for me, but I was doing my best to save him. I made it about a hundred yards and I had to set him down. He must have been in considerable pain. He asked me to leave him there and to go get help. His voice sounded very weak, and I almost broke into tears right there. Somehow, I, I held myself together. I ran for about a mile or so without stopping. My mom must have known something was wrong. She yelled out in a panicked voice for my father. My dad came out of the tent, took one look at me and said, How bad is it? I was too witted to speak. I just pointed to where I, I sat him down and he took off. By the time I had caught up with him, my dad was already picking him up and heading for camp. The entire ride to the hospital, my mom kept talking to him, telling him to hold on. I rode in the back seat, holding my shirt against the wound the whole way there. What would have normally been at least a 30 minute drive took us 20. My dad handed him off to the doctors. They had him in surgery within the hour, and the next three were a long, living nightmare. More shocked than anything, I was just in amazement at how calmly my parents were handling everything. Having become a parent since I realized they were far from calm, but they handled it well, either way. It was after midnight sometime when the doctors gave us the news. Things had been touch and go for a long time. I only found out much later that Mike had died more than once during surgery, but Mike had a good chance of recovering completely. The police, having been notified of the shooting, arrived soon after to question us. Now that the urgency of the situation had passed, I broke down several times during my recollection. That was the first time I came to grips with the possibility that I could have been shot myself. Mike was going to be in the hospital for a few weeks, so my parents got a hotel room nearby. I think my dad considered staying at the camp, but after a very short discussion with my mom, he decided against it. The detectives handling the case kept us up to date, but as late as the day Mike was discharged, no names had been connected to the case. The most widely held theory is that a poacher mistook the movement in the bushes for a deer and fired. It accounts for the lack of red flags during the search through hunting licenses. It was not the first time this happened, and sadly, will not be the last. Mike was one of the fortunate ones. 34 years have passed since then, and nobody has been decisively connected to the shooting. Mike did make a full recovery and went on to start his own business and family just like any other normal person. Something great did come out of this mess. We never returned to the National Forest, and even better, my dad decided with all those fat tourists and their RVs being around, it was safer just for him to stay at home. Being 12 and 17, I got to spend my holidays in awesome places like Yosemite and the Grand Canyon. This was the way I always thought camping should be, peaceful and quiet and I am almost positive Mike would agree with me. Way back when I was in my mid-twenties, in the late 1980s, I used to be a hardcore camper and hiker. 
but given that my home state of Rhode Island is like the size of a postage stamp, relatively speaking anyway, I exhausted a lot of the more local campgrounds quickly and began to look for something a little wilder. I'd heard a lot of great things about the Appalachian Trail, how hiking was a badge of honor for a lot of people who shared my passion for the outdoors. My uncle, on my dad's side, had hiked the whole thing over the course of a summer back in the 50s. He had never shut up about it. Whenever he would see me, he would just talk about it and bring it up, and the subject of hiking came up all the time. He made it sound magical, like there was true wilderness out there, just waiting to be explored. And so, I made up my mind to mimic the journey my uncle took over one summer. I could not get the time off work to walk the whole trail, but if I timed it right, I could walk the southern portion of the trail from Harper's Ferry to Asheville, North Carolina, in just a couple of weeks, fulfilling a hiking dream I had for what seemed like an age. Then, in the summer of 1989, I traveled down to Harper's Ferry by bus and by train with all my hiking and camping gear on my back. After picking up a few final supplies for my journey south, I hiked up onto the Appalachian Trail and kicked off the journey of a lifetime. The first few days were tough, but I got used to the level of strain quickly, and I'm telling you I've never been as hungry or tired as I was on those first few nights up in the Appalachia. I brought a hammock with me, as I heard some intense stories about the bugs down in West Virginia. Nasty little beasties with names like the Assassin Bug, which basically has a big spike for her mouth, were cow killer ants, whose stings are so painful that they are said to have killed an actual cow once or twice. That had to be pure rumor, but it was intimidating nonetheless, so every night after the day's hike, I would take it out of my pack, unroll it, and tie it up between two trees before getting some shut-eye. It did not make for the comfiest night's sleep I ever had, but I was not complaining, especially if it kept the Black Widows off me. But since I was out in the woods, most nights without cover, every little hooch or squawk from nocturnal animals would wake me up. It was irritating, sure, but it was part and parcel of being out and bonding with nature. So... This one night, I wake up sure I had heard something rustling in the leaves close by. I shift in my hammock, peering over my shoulder, and then feel blood run cold as I see a big, dark shape looming. I froze for a moment, feeling my eyes adjust to the darkness, and I could tell that there was a large person looming right over me, just standing there, statue still staring. In one fluid motion, I rolled out of my hammock and hit the ground running, bolting off into the trees. I did not give a damn who the hell was standing over me. Whoever does that kind of thing did not have the best intentions in the first place, and I was not about to stick around to make small talk either. I ran a safe distance off into the woods, caught my breath, and circled around, and then started sneaking back towards my camp. My intention was to make sure it was clear before gathering up my stuff and moving to a safer spot. I took it slowly, scanning the darkness for any sign of the shadowy figure, eventually finding my way back to my camp to discover it was completely deserted, with all of my gear apparently untouched. I had this horrible feeling in my gut that whoever had been standing there had just backed off to watch from a distance and would wait for me to come back to get my stuff before ambushing me. If they were not there to steal from me, it was obviously that they wanted something else entirely. I dreaded to think exactly what that was. But regardless, I managed to grab my stuff and get the hell out of the area without anyone managing to sneak up on me. The next few days, I walked hard and fast, exhausting myself in any attempts to get as far away from that area as possible. After that, I figured I was safe. No one had bothered me during the previous few days hiking, so I figured... I would be okay from there on out, but I was wrong, hideously wrong. Every single night since that incident had me struggling to get sleep. I kept picturing that person standing over me, just staring down at me in the darkness. I had no idea how long they had been there or what they had wanted or what they had in mind for me, and I was only glad as hell that I had gotten out of the area. But still, I did not start to be able to feel safe again until I had bought some fishing line from Sporting Goods Store. 
I found it in a small town I passed through on my way down the trail. I could then use this to make trip wires that ran between the trees close to where I was camping. There would be a couple of empty cans of beans strewn together, and whoever snagged their foot in wire would make them clank together, alerting me to their presence. I had one big scare when a fox snagged the line and I rolled out of my hammock with a knife, ready to take on whoever was there, only to see the furry little guy scurrying away in the midnight. I did end up laughing to myself about that one, and after that, I stopped sleeping with a knife in my hand, because all it would do was take one slip and I would have, you know, obviously messed myself up, and I would be in a world of trouble. About a week went by and I had just about gotten over the whole shadowy figure in the night incident. I had to be about 100 miles away from where it had taken place by now, and I had no trouble on any of the other nights, save the incident with the fantastic Mr. Fox that about scared the hell out of me. So, with the help of my little tripwire alert device, I had just started being able to get to sleep without any trouble again. But that night I woke up suddenly to find that I could not move properly. I could not bring my arms up at my sides at all, and the material from my hammock seemed to be pushed up right into my face. I was cocooned by it, like the fabric was wrapped around my entire body. This had only just registered in my half-awake brain when I heard fabric snapping. Then boom, I hit the dirt, very hard, completely knocking the wind out of me. I had no idea what the heck was going on, struggling to break out of the hammock, only I could not. This is when I felt the hammock being dragged across the forest floor. Then it hit me. Whoever this was was dragging me across the ground and had bundled me up in my own hammock with cord. They then cut me off the ropes and then are dragging me off to God knows where. I screamed at the top of my lungs for whoever it was to let me the hell out of there, but no one responded. All I could hear was the sound of the hammock's fabric rustling against the forest floor. I knew I had to think fast or whatever was going on would not end well at all. As I said, I had stopped sleeping with my knife in my hand or nearby me in the hammock because that was just an accident waiting to happen, so I had obviously nothing handy to cut through the material or to make any escape, or so I thought. In a flash, I had an idea. A few years back, my dad had gifted his old wristwatch to me. It was a reliable old thing, but I had just one complaint about it. The little latch thing that kept it tied to my wrist was torn with age and was a little sharp from the years of use. I had managed to accidentally poke myself a few times with it in the process of picking it up or putting it on, and one time it did draw blood. I knew what I had to do. I unbuckled the watch as quickly as I could, which was not easy considering I was getting dragged along the ground in pitch darkness, and managing to pinch the sharp clasp between my thumb and index finger was even harder, but still I managed it, and when I did, I began to rake it against the fabric of the hammock. It was just as effective as cutting canvas as it was cutting skin, and although it took a good few tries, it did not take long until I was able to see a subtle glow of the silvery moonlight from the other side. I kept cutting, as quickly and quietly as I could manage, until there were so many cuts that I could rip myself out of that canvas cocoon like some terrified newborn bursting out of a womb. You'll have to excuse the analogy, but in retrospect, that is exactly what it seemed like. I was born again that night. I got a second chance at living. Escaping that hammock meant life, because I know that staying in there would have meant death. For the second time in about ten days, I found myself bounding through the dark woods. Only that second time, the terror in me dwarfed what I had felt the first time around. I don't even know how I managed to escape. Assuming it was the same figure standing over me from that first night, they had somehow managed to track me for more than a hundred miles and sneak past my tripwires. They were a far better woodsman than me, probably physically fitter too. I just know that by the time I reached a house with its lights on, and I turned to look behind me as I was banging on the door, there was no one else around. The family who lived there were kind enough to put me up for the night after I called the local sheriff who came out in the morning to help me retrace my steps through the woods. We found my camp but not the hammock, and although I told him everything in excruciating detail, I could tell he was extremely skeptical of my story. He even suggested I had just gotten lost and frightened in the dark and ended up jumping at shadows, maybe even had a bad dream that seemed a little too vivid because of the lack of proper rest, but I know it was real. Just from the way my palms are sweating writing this, I am certain 
that night really did happen the way I remember it. I never did finish that dream hike. The next day, I caught a bus back towards Harper's Ferry, then took the train all the way back to Providence, and I have only ever told a handful of people what happened out on the trails. I figured not many would really believe me. They would just think I was telling a campfire tale or something. I did not tell my hiking uncle for the longest time. I thought he would just gloat or whatever. Tell me I did not have it in me to do something that tough. But when I finally did tell him my story, I got a reaction that I was not expecting. He just nodded and told me that there were some nights that he did not think he would make it out alive either. That there are people who live up in those mountains who have been outlaws for generations, who live outside of society, outside of the natural order of things. He had some close calls himself at times, bumping into people who were clearly not nearly as friendly as the majority of West Virginians, and sometimes seeing things he knew darn well he was not supposed to see. But just what those things were, he did not seem to want to say. You know, I always told myself to try my little Appalachian adventure another time, but maybe when I'm older, maybe wiser, and when I have gotten something a little bit bigger to defend myself with. The trail will still be there, waiting for me. But then again, so might be whoever tried to drag me off that night. This is the story of my first, and subsequently my last, camping experience. I was 16 at the time, and my family, my mother, sister, and brother, had made plans to go camping with our aunt, uncle, and two cousins over the weekend. This was my family's first real camping trip, while my cousins, aunt, and uncle had gone camping dozens of times. Our first afternoon and evening of camping went quite well. I surprisingly had a lot of fun. It was later that night, maybe around 10.30 or so. My cousins, my sister, and myself were settling into our tent. We were lying in our makeshift bed when we heard footsteps circling around our tent. Slightly alarmed by this, we sat up and noticed that whoever was outside circling our tent was holding what we assumed to be a stick and tracing the tent as they circled it. At one point, my sister sticks her hand out and feels a leg through the tent's fabric. We knew it was not our mom, as she has a trach and her breathing is very deep and distinct. It was not our brother, because he was only five at the time and we heard grown adult footsteps. They were much too heavy to be a child's. Our cousins informed us that it was probably their dad who always likes to play pranks, especially at night. We decided to look out the small window, if you'd like to call it that. It gave us a view that looked towards the road located by our campsite. On the road was my uncle and aunt walking back from the restrooms. My cousins, sister and I, started to connect the dots. Whoever was outside, circling our tents, was not a member of our family. It was a stranger, and all that separated us from that individual was a thin layer of fabric. As our uncle and aunt approached our campsite, we called them over to our tent and told them what happened. Everything stopped after a while. We talked with our aunt and uncle for a bit. We assumed that the individual ran away when our aunt and uncle approached the campsite. My cousins, sister, and I were still understandably freaked out about what had happened. But we were so tired that we were able to fall asleep eventually. The rest of the trip went seemingly well, and I enjoyed the rest of it as much as I possibly could. The worst part of it all was that nobody believed us. In fact, our aunt, uncle, and mother made fun of us and told us that we were just being paranoid as my cousin, sister, and I love everything creepy from conspiracy theories to urban legends. It still bothers me all the time because I never found out who that individual was or what their intentions were. I also think about what could have happened if our aunt and uncle did not come when they did. It is not like we would be able to defend ourselves as we were just four teenage girls at the time. Ever since then, I have been turned off from camping, and I do not see myself going again in the future. Hey Swamp Dweller, I have been listening to your channel for a few months now, and I decided to send you one of my stories. 
I have a few questions about it and would like to know your opinion. Before we begin, I want to give you some context. I come from a small town in northern Wisconsin. I am not going to say the town, because I would prefer not to be doxxed, but the whole town is split in half near the descendants of German and Irish settlers that came here in the 1850s and 60s. The whole town is immensely proud of our roots, especially my family. My dad's side of the family is German, and a lot of our family traditions come from our German side. However, my mom's side is Irish. When I was young, my grandfather, who lived in the town his entire life, would babysit us frequently. When he would babysit us after school, he would tell us stories from traditional Irish folklore. While my mother's family had lived in the area for nearly 200 years, my grandpa still held on deep to a thick Western Irish accent. Because of my grandfather's knowledge of all the old stories, my siblings and I had an intricate knowledge of Irish spirits and fairies. As the years went by, I joined the Boy Scouts and rapidly jumped through the ranks and eventually attended summer camps. I still, to this day, love camping. I fell in love with the summer camp, so much that the following year I returned as a camp staff member. The camp is old. It was founded in the 1940s, right after the Second World War had ended. Many of the buildings could be traced to those initial years, or were built in the same style and materials, giving the camp a rustic appearance. During the day, it was one of the homiest and welcoming places I have ever been to. At night, when the only light source is the dim light of the moon, it can be a different story. This environment spawned essentially a million different ghost stories, all of which I dismissed at first. I have had a handful of minor and slightly terrifying encounters, some of which I could tell you if you are interested. While admittedly, the camp was a little more than a bit creepy at night, I would often go on short walks to help myself relax. This is where I found myself in late June of 2018. My grandfather had been diagnosed with cancer shortly before I had left for camp. He had seemed in fine health before I left, and the doctors ensured us that he would probably make a full recovery. Although, I had recently been having problems getting to sleep, which consequently led me to taking longer and longer walks as the summer had gone on. That night, there was a bright full moon, illuminating the entire camp. Combined with growing up in the woods my entire life, I was quite comfortable with walking around the forest at night. As for the animals, aside from the occasional mountain lion and local coyotes, bears, and wolves, they would rather leave you alone. What I'm trying to get at is that I had nothing to create any sense of worry for me at the time. The sense of security I had created in my mind allowed me to drift around the camp and lose myself in thought without a second glance. I decided to walk back to my cabin after checking my phone for the time. My phone said it was 11.17. Quickly, I mentally kicked myself, mostly because I need to shower, brush my teeth, and all the other bedtime rituals we perform. I shared my cabin with 14 other staff members, all guys I had worked with and got to know very well over the last three years. The entrance to the cabin was a little communal area, simply called the lounge where we would all hang out until we had gone to bed. The only thing you will need to know is that my cabin is located directly over the boathouse. As I walked down the path to the cabin, I must have blacked out or something, because I strangely found myself on top of a waterfront hill. I do not actually remember going to the lakefront, nor remember walking there. I was understandably confused, but being at the waterfront hill is a stone throw away from my cabin. I did not really think about it much. I chose to start walking back to the cabin, grumbling about wasting time. However, I noticed something in the lake. I walked down three steps towards the water before I realized what it was. I saw what appeared to be a person hunched over in the water. Every now and again, some scout would get this brilliant idea to swim in the lake at night. That or two staff members in the throes of a summer camp romance would decide to go skinny dipping. So I called out, Hey there, can't be swimming right now. The individual in question did not respond to me, so I decided to walk down closer to the lake and call out to the person again. As I got closer, more and more features started to become apparent. 
I assumed it was a woman because the individual had long dark hair, and she was wearing what I could only assume would be a green ankle length dress. I was about three quarters of the way down the hill before I had stopped. I stared at her for a bit. I could tell that she was doing something in the water. Although, if you had to ask me what she was doing, I would not be able to tell you for the life of me. I decided to walk into the waterfront area itself. Ma'am. I tried yelling at her to get her attention as I approached. At this point, I was maybe 20 feet away from her. As I approached the dock, I yelled at her again. Ma'am. This time, I had managed to catch her attention as she stopped what she was doing. You can't be down here right now. I started to say as she slowly started to stand up. At this point, a shiver went up my spine. Although I would not be able to tell you why, my brain started hitting every alarm bell and giving me the instinct to flee. But I kept my feet planted in the sand below. When she fully stood up, it dawned on me why I was so uneasy. She was not making a single sound. When you move in water, you are bound to at least make a bit of sound, especially considering the amount of water that I could see was dripping off of her. When I was hit with this realization, I noticed that she had started to turn around. I could feel my brain begin to go into slow-mo before she had turned around. When she had fully turned around, I got a perfect look at her. She was pale. She practically glowed in the moonlight. I could tell she was soaked, not just like she was splashing in the water. Instead, it looked like she had just climbed out of the shower. Although the thing that strikes me even to this day and keeps me awake at night were her eyes. While her entire body was perfectly proportional, her eyes were much larger than any. I, I, I think her eyes would be the size of my fist, and they were jet black. Finally, my instincts took over, but instead of running off, I just fell back onto the solid boardwalk that the ranger had built the month before. She slowly approached me, until she was about four or five feet away from me. That is when she opened her mouth beyond what was humanly possible and she let out a scream. As soon as I heard that scream, I had become frozen in place and reached to clench my ears. I am not going to kid you with this. I could barely move. I, I just writhed around in pain on the ground until I could finally cover my ears. While now it sounded like a scream, it was now echoing in my head, but now at least I could move. I very slowly forced myself up with my elbows, not daring to uncover my ears. After getting to my feet, I slowly fought my way back up the boardwalk. After struggling with those first few steps, I was able to move easier and faster. After I made my way out of the waterfront area, the woman's scream began to wind down. As she wound down, I found out that I was able to sprint again. As I took those first two steps, I heard her begin to scream with the same intensity as before. Instead of paralyzing me as I did before, I was able to continue unabated. Frankly, I have no idea if she allowed me or not. At the time, I did not care. All I know is that I could still hear the scream and its echo just as loudly as before. Eventually, I burst through the screen door on the cabin. I reached to my right and grabbed the massive oak door and slammed it shut. I locked it and grabbed one of the nearby couches and pushed it up to the door. I did not realize at the time but two of my friends were sitting on the couch, one of which alone probably weighed near 300 pounds. Adrenaline really is the greatest thing. After building my makeshift barricade, I see the rest of the cabin had wandered into the lounge. Our program director saw how terrified I was and quickly pulled me into his room and asked me what had happened. Yet for some reason I could not tell him, not because I didn't want to, but because instead, I physically could not produce the words needed to explain what had happened. I could not sleep that night, and I did not let anyone leave the cabin either. After the camp's morning flag ceremony, our camp director asked me to come into his office. After arriving, he explained to us that he had just received a call from our parents at the hospital that our grandfather had died the night before. I was shocked, not only that I had lost a relative that I have always been close with, but gears had started to turn in my head. I asked our camp director if he knew what time my grandfather had died. He told me he did not know. He then followed up and told me that if I wanted to take a day or two off, he would understand. I waved his offer and left to return to my department. As I walked out of the office, I sent my dad a text asking what time my grandfather died. 
A short time later, I felt my phone vibrate. I opened up the text I just received. It was my dad's response to my previous text. It read, 1121, why? I am almost certain that I saw a banshee. Banshees, for those who do not know, are a spirit from ancient Irish mythology. It is usually a sign of bad things to come or a death or something like that. My questions are, the banshee is an Irish spirit. Why was it in rural Wisconsin? I had asked all my family members if they saw something like that. None of them ever admitted to seeing something like that. Assuming they are telling the truth, and I have no reason to assume they are not, why am I the only one that has seen it? How did none of the other staff members in my cabin hear her scream? And why did it stop when I entered the cabin? Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true outdoors horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future video, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp, as stories like yours that truly help keep this show going. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to hit that like button as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this video gets, the more YouTube promotes it in the algorithm. If you're listening on iTunes or another podcast platform, please give this a 5-star rating, as that truly helps me out a lot. If you're new to the swamp, why not join us and help us expand our ever-growing waters? Hit that subscribe button, and be sure to turn on notifications to never miss a new video, as I upload them almost every single day on all things natural and supernatural. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future video, whether it's an outdoors story or something else, be sure to submit that at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp, as stories like yours that help keep this show going on a daily basis. If you guys would like to support the swamp outside of hitting that like button and subscribing, maybe check out the membership option on the channel, or maybe check out our merch store. I have everything from face masks, to t-shirts, to hoodies, and everything else you could ever want from a YouTuber. Anyways, if you guys are on the road and don't have YouTube Premium but still want to listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller Scary Stories wherever you go, you can do so absolutely free by downloading them from iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, and just about everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. Thank you guys so much for always supporting the swamp the way you do. I couldn't do this without you guys. I'll see you guys soon with another creepy video.